Welcome to the Julia and Gino podcast, where business meets family. We explore what the entrepreneurial life looks like from a family perspective. We are your hosts, Julia and Gino Barbaro. Hey everyone, this is Julia Barbaro, host of the Julia and Gino podcast. I'm here with the co-founder of Jake and Gino, my husband and co-host, Gino Barbaro. Hey, Joel. Hey, How are you doing? I'm great. I am excited yeah. for today's guest. He's been on the Jake and Gino show He is the author of Restoring Reason. He helps aspiring scholars properly pursue a self-taught education in critical thinking in order to take responsibility and ownership of their own minds. Welcome back, Dr. T, Dr. Travis Corkin. How are you doing? Good, man. It's great to be back. Good to see you again, man. So let me put the book up for everybody on YouTube, Restoring Reason. My wife read it in a day. So if my wife can read it in a day, there's no (laughs) excuse for all of you out there not to be able to read it. It's a great introductory into what the trivium is. We're going to dive into the trivium. Let's get back to a little bit of logic and reasoning and understanding and to be able to debate like adults, invite conflict with respect. That's what I, you know, I've been taught a few months ago and I'm like, that makes sense. So Dr. Mm -hmm. T, you just want to share your story with everybody, you know, what inspired you to write the book and you know, what you're doing right now as far as business. The book, I was inspired to write it just because, yeah, not, not only in my own profession, like we just spoke about. I'd like to see reason restored in my own profession. But outside of that, you know, we we all live together. We share the planet together. I'd like to see reason restored to politics, to relationships, to healthcare, to policies, to business. I don't know any successful business people that make rash emotional decisions. Uh, successful business people, I mean, we're all we're all emotional. You know, I wake up with passion for my business. But how I steer the business is based on reason. I don't know anyone that like, I'm sure there's some lightning strikes every now and then, but someone makes a rash decision, hits it big, but that is not predictable success and uh, fast success based on emotion doesn't really build character It may build ego. So I wanted to restore reason. And like you said, too, I want to restore it to discussions. In fact, I'd like there to be an end to debates because debates are competitions with uh, an implied winner and loser, but a discussion, if done properly, has two winners, right? Because they're they're concerned on which concept or principle prevails, which one's superior, not which one I hold or I'm attached to. And that means whether I'm, if uh, I'm presenting a concept or principle, you present a superior one, I did not lose. I'm now wiser because I now have the superior concept as well. I want everyone to rewind that back. And that was the, what you just said there, it was really enlightening. Even to me, as you're saying it, I can feel my ego and myself saying, I want to be right. Mm -hmm. And that's how most people are. I need to read this quote here because it's really important. What reason is, I want everyone to write this down because this is truly important. This is the theme of the show. And I think the theme of Dr. T's book, it's the power of the mind to think, understand, and form judgments by a process of logic. Do you want to expand upon that? Because that's really, really important. That's really the the crux of what we're trying to do with restoring reason. Yeah. Like I said, emotions are, you know, they're unavoidable. They're automatic. That's why they're called emotional reactions. But reasoning, by thinking with logic, that that is what gives stability to our lives, right? Mm Because logic and reason follows rules. It's systematic, reliable, stable, repeatable. Mm -hmm. And that's what you want in business. That's what you want for your children. That's what you want for your relationships. I want my relationships to be stable, right? But with emotions, you know, to base anything on emotion is crazy. I'm not saying emotions are bad. It's just, that's not, not the function they serve. Emotions don't determine truth hoods and falsehoods, right? I feel strongly about this. That doesn't make something true. Mm-hmm. So reason is that we need that coupled with emotion. And again, why I wrote this book, we live in a very emotionally toxic world. Emotions are great, but you can't have too much, just like watering a plant. I don't do it with a fire hose. It's just too much. And I want to bring reason back because it's been um, like you guys homeschool your children. What a great idea, because it's being slowly picked away out of our schools Mm -hmm. in the place of like, what I think Julie and I talked about this at the end of the Mm -hmm. Jake show. It's more like social and emotional learning so they're encouraging and engendering like ex- radical extremeness and that's not stable because your emotions change minute to minute i mean you guys could say a few choice words to me and compliment me make me feel like so good or you could really bring me down you know emotions change the rules of reason and logic do not they are stable and reliable that's why they're so powerful for a business for a relationship 
for healthcare, everything. Hmm. You just you just define me. I'm stable and I'm reliable, oh, bro. Boy. So that's great. I like that. Everybody, because <laughs> I keep letting you talk. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I want to get you had mentioned children, you had mentioned raising a family relationships. And, and, you know, this all starts at home, because we all were raised by parents, maybe they were just, you know, argued on emotion constantly. And we've all experienced that other people, you know, my one of my daughters, Veronica, when we are arguing or someone else is arguing, she literally says, Can I go home now? <laughs> <It's her laughs> phrase. She hates to be in that situation of the emotion going back and forth. And it's so yeah, interesting. Yeah. But it's, it's a good topic to talk about is starting from the parents in the home. How are we interacting? I love how you said, let's not look at debate. Let's look at discussion because I agree with you. We could become more wise, like you said, if we just take the time and listen to the other side. And I want to let's talk about that a little bit, if you don't mind, uh, Travis. I, I want to talk about, you know, even the marriage on how to have a discussion with your spouse, or maybe Gina can talk about it <laughs> without getting emotional, because it's funny that the, the, between the both of us, he's actually the more emotional. I mean, <laughs> let's just be honest. I'm needy. I'm emotional. <laughs> I, I went from being stable and logical to being needy and emotional. I'm Italian. I mean, like, he's Italian. Italian. He's really, Italian. He's Italian. I picked up on that passion on the Jake and Gino show. I was like, this guy, oh, he's got passion. I could feel it, man. Well, Dr. Travis, honestly, the passion comes from this. When I see stupidity or laziness, that really bothers me more than anything else. And I get passionate about that because yes. people make excuses. And I think logic denotes that we need to be responsible for our lives. And a lot of people sure. pass off the responsibility. You're in the health field. Be responsible for your health. Be responsible but for what you put in your mouth. But it takes a person to actually say, I was wrong. Yeah. Wow, I never thought of it on your side. And that's what it takes. We're, we're in this selfish world where we want to be right. Even if we know we're wrong, we still want to argue our point. I messed you up. What was your question? I just, I don't I just jumped in there. So. <laughs> she was asking about the, the children and mm -hmm. uh, how we should start with the children, which I agree. That's why mm -hmm. they're called, like, they're not called the formative years. <laughs> by happenstance, right? Uh, they're the formative years because they're learning emotionally, mostly by imitation. So I'm, you know, so many people say, I don't want to end up like my mother or father, but like when, when your stress is over your threshold of uh, rationality and you have no choice but to react, you will likely react in the way that your parents did and what you observed in those first seven years, like how my parents respond to something funny, something sad, something sort I am like a mirror image of that, you know? Mm -hmm. And so the best we can do, because emotions are automatic, the best we can do if there's something you want to change is that you can, you can work on how you manage those emotions, but it's very difficult to undo something that was created in those first uh, seven years, those formative years. And by what you guys are doing is fantastic. I mean, the, the homeschooling, folks on discussion, rational discussion, right? And that's how they're acquiring knowledge, not just empirically, but rationally as well. That is a, the best start for a child because sending them off to uh, uh, compulsory state mandated, it, I'm using the term education loosely, schooling, uh, they're not really learning. I've talked about this with uh, some people in the, just not too long ago. In school, there is no opportunity to learn because there is no discernment. There's no two sides, no two stories it's like, hey, this is what happened in history class, 1492, Columbus did this, blah, blah. It's just a narrative. And in every aspect and every course, which they're all compartmentalized as well, and you go around like Pavlov's dog, according to a bell, marching in order, mm -hmm. it, it is not education by any means. Education only occurs when I have two things and I have to discern between two. There was something that uh, Gino said at the beginning about conflict that is very necessary for children. They need healthy conflict. They need to know how to enter conflict, resolve conflict, healthy. Conflict clarifies Without it, um, you're just a believer or a zealot because there's the one narrative, anything outside of it, we must shun that, you know, but the kids now, it's, it's very difficult. There's a prize for everything. They don't what, know what it's like to deal with loss or mm -hmm. conflict and competition in a healthy way. There's, we've just lost all respect for that. Enter the Barbaro household, conflict <laughs> everywhere, because we are competing. I crushed my daughter last night in chess. Competing. So I just wanted to know. I He's just the only I one in the house that competes. I, I just compete. want to go. I just want to go there again. You are really okay. This is funny. This is a good podcast. I'm funny. needy. I'm competitive. I'm like <laughs> illogical. Well, on the can list. you give us some tips? Can you give the listeners some little tips on? And I and I do want everyone to get the restoring reason 
Uh, your book is really incredible and, you know, super eye-opening and helpful, even as a mother in the home. Can you give everyone tips on restoring that at home? Yeah. Because like I said, as a mom, sometimes you do go off emotion because they're tired. <laughs> There's a lot going on. Yeah. There's a lot of people yeah. talking to you all the time. And sometimes you do run off emotion and then your kids also do as well. So give us some tips. The first thing is everything's easier to do when you have a purpose. So when your purpose is clearly defined, it's hard to get burnt out and depressed because, you know, you wake up every day. This is my purpose. I'm going to fulfill it. When I create goals, those goals must be fulfill this purpose. And then I create habits that fulfill, that uh, makes me the kind of person to create those goals. But I would say the first thing I would do if I were a parent is what you guys have already done. The parent has to be incredibly informed about why they're doing what they're doing and why it's so necessary. And the best way to do that is to read that book that you just showed me that from John Taylor Gatto. There's nothing to fix if you don't understand there's a problem first. And he, that like Gina was saying before we jumped on this podcast, he go, he says, this book is very depressing. Yeah, of course. And that's what gives you the motivation to something must be done about this. If there's, that's the fire that should burn inside you. Like my children are my responsibility, right? And I want to impart that onto them. So reading that book is like a great, like motivator. Something must be done. But uh, I always recommend the book, that other one you got there. That was probably my all-time favorite book in the world. And I would say like, if you're homeschooling children, that is the ultimate textbook as they enter, like I'll recommend another book for you, but as they get to that sophomoric phase, like 12 to 14, that book should be, in my opinion, the primary focus. But like what Gino said, and this why, like I wrote the book in the way that I did, is because that book by Sister Miriam Joseph is so dry, but it is packed full of just value, right? Mm -hmm. It's just not delivered in a very attractive way. And people don't understand how's that going to affect my life? And that's why I wrote my book the way I did. It's very easy to read. Like Gino said, it's just the perfect primer for this like very hard study or lesson that Sister Miriam Joseph brings out. I would do those books in that order. So let's get this. Restoring reason, number one. And number two is dumbing us down. And number three is the trivium by Sister Miriam. Now, we did the same thing, I think, on, on our podcast. Can you just define what the trivium is really quick and get, have people understand what it is? I know it's one of the seven liberal arts. If we can go into those three, just real quick and give a recap of them, because it's really important for parents to hear what they yeah. are. That's the other book I want to recommend for you guys, too. It's um, it's only like 25 pages. It was originally in uh, a speech that was transcribed to an essay by Dorothy Sayers. It's called The Lost Tools of Learning by Dorothy Sayers, S-A-Y-E-R-S. -E but the, the trivium classically is knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. And so the first liberal art is really concerned with how you construct your statements, how you define your words, right? The order that the words go in. So it's constructing a statement. And that first liberal art is concerned with correctness. Is it correct or incorrect? So it's information, knowledge, data, evidence, it, which that's all it is. And we talked that knowledge is not power. The second liberal art, understanding, that's where logic and reason come in. That is not the construction of a statement, but using statements to construct an argument. And an argument is defined as a minimum of three statements, one of which is the conclusion, and the two or more other statements are premises for to derive that conclusion. So that's the second liberal art, the, the construction of your argument or claim. Is it follow the rules and are there any contradictions? Is it uh, errors of reason, logical inconsistencies? That's the second liberal art, understanding, logic and reason. And th to me, that's what real power is. Right. Just the first liberal art. Hey, I'm informed. OK, the second liberal art, that is personal empowerment. And then the third liberal art, wisdom or rhetoric or the basically the expression of the first two. Your, how well, how effectively do you express knowledge and understanding? Now, you already have self-empowerment when you understand something, but when you can properly express it, now you have influence that will make you successful in a relationship in business, but in whatever endeavor. And I wish I had met you 10 years ago, because as we were homeschooling, I felt a little inadequate. And what you had said on the Jake and Gino show is really important for me to, to repeat. It's the three R's. The super elites are teaching us, teaching their children, reading, writing, and reckoning, as Sister Miriam says. And then you go, go through that, because I think that's the genesis of, if you're schooling yeah. your kids, or even if they're going to school and they're coming back home, if you could focus on those three 
that will really create the basis for that. So can you go over those three real quick for the listeners? Yeah, John Taylor Gatto discusses this brilliantly too. And if there's time, I'll share a great story from him as well. But it is read, write, and reckoning or debate, right? Read, mm-hmm. write, and debate. And reading, like this is the, John Taylor Gatto talks about these people. These are like the elite, elite, elite schools, right? There, there's no chance you're ever getting in there, to be honest. And what they do is they read because reading is the, best form of acquiring knowledge. It also teaches patience as well and and discipline. So reading is how they acquire knowledge. Writing is how they practice the second liberal arts, which is they have to write like a thesis or construct their arguments. So now you're being creative, constructing your arguments and make arguments, making sure there's no inconsistencies in the logic, no errors in the reason, or no formal fallacies, fallacies of the form or structure of argument. And then debating, testing your ability or your effectiveness at communicating those things. That's the third liberal art. It's only concerned with effectiveness. It's not concerned with whether something's correct, true, or false. Those are the first liberal arts. The third liberal art is solely concerned with how effective do I communicate this, whether it's true, false, correct, incorrect. And that's all the elite study. Read, write, debate, and then they do it again. Read, write, debate. Do you want to share your story with Dr. Gatto? I'd love to hear it. Oh, yeah. John Taylor Gatto. I heard this once. He was, as you know, he I think he was, it was like three years in a row or at least three times he was elected or selected as teacher of the year in like New York City. Like, that's tough, man. Right. <laughs> so this guy is like prestigious, highly credentialed by like academia, which is one of the institutions I'm criticizing in my book. And he does as well. And the story he told was about how he, figured all this out and left. And what it was, in an interview, he was talking about how a, an 11-year-old student or 10-year-old student was telling him, explaining his a story about how his grandfather told him how flea circuses were done. How do you get these little fleas to carry around tiny miniature Roman chariots and to walk on a trap? How do you get these fleas to do that? Well, you put them in a glass jar, and uh, if you put them in a glass jar, they just fly out and go about flea business. But then you put a lid on that. And what they do is they they bump into each other, they fight, and then they they find the limits of the, the jar. And eventually you can take the lid off. You can even take away the jar because their will has been broken, and they just stay right there. Mm-hmm. And he re- the moment he realized that his job in the, in the education system that he was hired to be a lid on the jar is when he handed in his resignation. And it's his speech, the final time he was selected as teacher of the year, that speech, man, that could have been heard across the world because it was the most condemning speech of the art uh, education system or school system that I'd ever heard. And it was just on point too. Isn't it amazing that someone did something for 30 years and had the courage and had the bravery to say, I've been living a sham life for the last 30 years. And it's almost like right now going through COVID after two years, some things are being replaced. And if they, people have the will that for the last two years, they've been sold a bill of goods and some of those goods were right. And some of those goods were wrong. Well, I mean, let's say for masks, for instance, did they work? Did they not work? After two years, it was like, oh, they don't work now. But for the last two years, I've been getting yelled at to put one on now. Are we going yeah. to admit that maybe they were wrong about certain science and all? So I yeah. give him a ton of credit after 30 years of life's work to be trying to do the best he could. And I think his whole thing was he empowered a lot of students and he changed a lot of lives. So he could, he could be happy and he could be proud about that. But maybe yeah. the system that he was in maybe wasn't wasn't the system that he wanted to be. he is the absolute like um it, he is the greatest evidence that it's never too late to change your mind mm-hmm. and that, like what you're saying right now too the, the admiration for that because we all know how yes. difficult it is to say i was wrong and to do it after 30 years too you know oh, i forgot the most compelling part of that story he said like flea circuses they were like to quote he said the delight of emperors. So he's like back in Roman times, 1600, 1600, these, I don't know, whatever. Back in Roman times, they use those same principles to train military troops. They break their wills. I mean, I, w- I was a military man. I went to boot camp, shave our heads. We're all wearing the same clothes. They break your will, strip your identity. The, those same tactics were used for military personnel. And then it was the Prussian model of schooling along. And now it's for the citizenry to have an allegiance to the state. And what he said at the end was what really shook me to the core. He said, all this was done without the information distribution systems we have now, all the technology we have today and no TV, no radio. He goes, do you think that all these principles have just been lost 
or have they only become more sophisticated and over time more and more power gets leveraged into fewer and fewer hands? Do you think that all this was just forgotten or has it just become so much more incredibly sophisticated? That that hit me like, oh, he's so right. We don't even know how much we've been uh, deceived, manipulated. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, you know, it, it takes courage to stand up and to do what you, you know, it, it might take years for you to realize this is not what I thought it was. And it does take courage to actually stand up and, and talk about it. Cause a lot of us just go along with it because we don't want to be the one that says something and no one else agrees with us. And we're just standing there by ourselves. You know what I mean? <laughs> but the important thing is where we're getting our knowledge from. You know, my mom always said, if you want to know about Christopher Columbus, read his own writing. Don't read about someone that that wrote about him, you know, yeah. years and years later that never knew him. And yeah. so where we get our knowledge is so important. And you mentioned the school district. Here's the history you're learning. You have to take what we're saying as accurate. So let's yeah. talk about where people are getting knowledge from every, every about everything, about COVID, about whatever is going on now and what we're doing we, with that. I think uh, we've become so intellectually passive and lazy. In fact, I'll tell you one of the I think Jake and Gina would both love this. One of the, like someone wrote a, a, um, a criticism of my book saying like, oh, he doesn't give any references. And I was like, exactly. Yeah, you know, Pythagoras didn't give any references when he made his deductions and conclusions. Neither did Descartes when he did. That's the thing. We have become so incredibly dependent upon authority. Like, well, what's the authority say? See, I can't draw my own conclusions. I can't even listen to other people draw their own conclusions. Where's the authority? Where's the authority? Where's the reference? Where did you get this from? It had to come from somewhere. People can't derive their own knowledge, right? That that is was to me. I was like, this is one, this is someone who's just not getting the material of the book. That is so like the Stockholm syndrome is like chronic. It, it's just not going to, like we need an authority. Nothing's true without this say of the authority. Where's your reference? And you know what bothers me more than anything else is the experts. Where are the experts, number one? And number two, the experts is I've always been wrong. Since COVID started in my business, people weren't going to pay rent. Valuations were going to drop. There weren't going to be any deals. And everything has happened the opposite. Now they're talking about inflation. And it's the boogeyman. We need a boogeyman out there, whether it's the war in Ukraine, whether it's COVID, whether it's 2008, the Great Recession, whether it's the bankers, where it's there's always seems to be that. And let me backtrack one second before. My wife is talking about standing up to people. Throughout COVID, she had somebody. She wasn't wearing a mask. They weren't yelling at her. They were yelling at me who was wearing the mask. So she's Miss Bravery out there. I feel like everyone's there, afraid of me. Around. I don't know why. I walk in, I get, I, and my husband gets yelled at. I get yelled at. I mean, what, of course, I'd be brave if I was standing up and someone wasn't yelling at me, but was yelling at my spouse. I'd be like rushing in there and going, it's her fault. So <laughs> it, it was great during during COVID. But um, I'm sorry, you were going to say something, because to me, it's important. You were talking about where are the experts? Who are the experts out there? Well, here's the thing, man. These, uh, I'll tell you who, the, if you want to know who the experts are, Anyone that is uh, criticizing thinking for yourself, they, they're the self-proclaimed uh, experts, right? They want you hooked on the fish. They don't want to teach you to fish. Mm -hmm. That's the way I see it, right? And the, I see this so much. Like anyone that's critical of this, my whole book is critical of those five big institutions, so academia, big government, Hollywood, social tech, social media. And if you want to know like who is going to stand against this work or thinking for yourself, are people that are highly credentialed in the, within those institutions, legacy media, academia. Do you think they're going to have anything positive to say about a book or your podcast or anything that is condemning what they do? Mm -hmm. Right. They, they are depend. All their authority is dependent upon our belief in these big institutions like legacy, like mainstream media, legacy media, academia, big universities. If you're highly credentialed there and you have all the esteem and the awards, do you think that they're going to listen to this podcast, listen to John Taylor Gatto or read my book and not have incredible criticisms, like the mental gymnastics they're going to go through to set no references or um, yeah, he glibly uh, dismisses experts. And uh, yeah, it's, it's crazy. Well, it's interesting. I had mentioned this on a previous podcast, I think with Will Witt, is that we're taught in school, we're not allowed to question anything. And we yeah. all remember those people in school that would ask a question and get sent out of the room because, well, you're going against the teacher. And so <laughs> we're taught that, right? We're taught that in school, don't question authority. You're not allowed to think for yourself. 
And that's why I do love homeschooling. It is exhausting. Let me tell you, <laughs> because right. everyone in my house questions everything we do. It's easy for me. But, <laughs> 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 They're like, dad's coming. Everyone get your books out. <laughs> that is so true, by the way. It's reality. And it's like, okay, it's guys, reality. what are you guys doing? But you know what? I teach them life <laughs> skills too. Remember, okay. <laughs> so questions are good. Questions. I always look at questions. What they are, it's just a an intellectual searchlight. Mm -hmm. When you ask a question, you've, you've turned on the searchlight. You, you're looking to learn. Mm -hmm. Questions are so good, but you're, it's true what you say. We're punished if we ask mm -hmm. questions. And, and and to have children, you know, you don't have to homeschool to do this because your kids come home and ask us questions. And most of the time we just answer with, you know, that's because I said so, or one of these, one of these answers. And we're not, we're not forming our children to question to find out the answer, to maybe go to another source and say, let me find out, hey, kids, why don't you find out that answer? Because I don't know either. Why don't we look at it together? So it does open up a great um, conversation as a family to look for the source, look for the things that we believe in. Why are we this way? Why do we believe this? Let's find out. Let's give the kids answers. But what I really, really want to get to is, you know, we're talking about getting information, thinking logically, being able to talk amongst ourselves, what happens, and this has been very, it's been Prevalent. too much lately, when the other person you're talking to is literally running off emotion, and you're trying to have a, just a regular discussion with them. And it's, it's like something is happening, like they just can't understand what you're talking about. You're just asking a question and they, they answer you based off emotion. You know what I mean? Nowadays. I think we talked, maybe we talked about this a little bit before, but the first thing, uh, recognize where the, first you have to make sure like, am I being reasonable? Yeah. And yes. if you're calm, you're, but then, okay. Yes. Then the next thing to do when to proceed with someone who's highly emotional, can't calm down or seemingly can't is to continue with genuine inquiry. Not like, like, I think we talked before, like not, you know, a question is like, who do you think you are? That, that's not a yes. genuine question. Like hey, we may disagree, but I really want to understand how you draw those conclusions, where you're coming from. Is it okay to ask a few questions? Start like trying to tune them to your calmness and keep asking questions because it's very difficult for people. They'll get tired. It's very difficult mm -hmm. to think and react at the same time. And when you're asking questions, you're forcing them into thinking. And that's, they have to reduce their emotion. They have to, okay. The anger will reside just, or shut down for even a moment. Just like, well, I have to think of my answer. Keep the questions coming. Inquiry with compassion is the best way to, I think it, it doesn't mean you're going to win, which you should be trying to win anyway, but you're just trying to diffuse the situation, understand where they're coming from so that any future interaction, you can better plan and prepare. Because if you're a thoughtful person, that's what you're doing. You'll take as much time as it as you need for a response. What you were saying just before this too, I think, is also like one of the most underutilized things that people do, and you're doing it with your kids to say, "I don't know." Mm -hmm. Those, th I don't know. That, to me, that's one of the most powerful answers you can give it. I don't know. Let's find out. I when say that, that every day. I say that 15 times a day. So well, I'm that's, just a, write a lot that. of people have a hard time to say that because they do want to be the authority. They do want to be the yeah. parent that knows everything, which makes yeah. me laugh half the time because my kids really know that I don't know much. <laughs> you know, they went from thinking I knew everything. Maybe dad knows everything now. I don't know. <laughs> to, you know, I'm not sure if mom knows. Let's find out together. And so I do, uh, I do, you know, being real in the house is important. And I want the kids to know that, you know, we're just trying to figure this out together and, you know. I love learning with them, but they do need to see that their authority is the mother and the dad sometimes don't know. And, and yeah. I think that's helpful because then they grow up with this thought that they need to know everything when they become a parent. Um, yeah. Julie, do you mind if I go back like yes, a, a minute please. from where you're talking about it? This is important for parents because schooling, if now that it just, I just had an epiphany as you were talking in schooling, we're not taught to ask empowering questions, who, what, when, where, how. Mm -hmm. Those are really the crux. If you want to be a salesperson, if you want to be a leader, you need to be able to, to, to ask those questions and to understand it. And the other part is teamwork. Any company or any entity that works well within a team that can work together really succeeds. And, yeah. and if you're cheating in school, <laughs> you're, it's, it's, you're, you're going to get kicked out of the class. You're going to fail. But when Jake and I cheat amongst each other and we have other people in business, we're geniuses. We're ripping it's off cheap. and duplicating. It, yeah. We succeed at, exactly. Yeah. So when people are looking at it, if they're thinking of homeschooling and all, oh, 
think of it from that perspective. I mean, we're teaching our kids to work together, work in conjunction, asking questions, going out and debating. And in school, that's the opposite. So now when you graduate with a degree and you come out and you don't know how to ask those questions, or you don't, how, don't know how to say, I don't know, let me go look. You're really behind the eight ball. Well, I think it's a really pride proud. thing as well. Yeah. And like working as a team, because we, we do talk to a lot of um through Jake and Gino, through the, we have a couples coaching and a lot of, um, Gino students do work together. They, they work in real estate together and it is, you know, half the time they start in competition and they're working against each other because they want to be able to do the best job. Even though my husband has different gifts that I do, well, I want to be better than him. And so there's this competition when you're talking about teamwork. I'm a better singer. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> and I'm, and I'm okay saying that I, he's really good. <laughs> He's really yeah, good. All really right. Good. I got that. On wow. <laughs> I got that recorded. So the kids a couple are gold stars today. You know? <laughs> I, I, I'm a little needy, she said, but I, I'll take. But you know that. And that's why I love you, because you deep down, you know that even years ago, it was that's what I, I want to say is years ago, you know, you've we've grown a lot. And as adults, we have to say, OK, you know what? I was like that years ago. I don't want to be like yeah. that. So what am I going to do? to get over my, you know, competitiveness with my spouse, or even with our kids, a lot of us have it with our children is we want to be competitive, we want to be better, we could go there if you want, but you should see him play chess with the kids. Oh, boy. <laughs> well, it's no mercy. I, I want the reality of life. When you go out in life, you're not and, and I'm not saying first or yeah. second place. Well, I don't and, mean let them win. And I have a growth. Course. I have a growth mindset. My mindset is, if you want to be in first place, let's not take away from that person winning first place. If you're in fifth place, it's okay. You still did a great yeah. job. But let's not deny that that person right. worked harder or is even more more successful Killed. than you were. Yes. How do you get to that place? Like you need to work harder. Right. You need to put in more exactly. time. And, and I don't want them to say, "Oh, well, you know, I, I don't, I don't want that." I want them to well, get some kind of fortitude. I think that's what the school did years and years ago, and we kind of made fun of it. Everyone, where no one won first place or something like mm -hmm. that, and and it just teaches the kid, you know, it doesn't matter if you do better than the other person. It doesn't matter if you put in all that hard work and that knowledge for whatever it is you're doing. And I think that also takes away what we're talking about as well is to be able to, I want to learn more. I want to be wise. I want to, I want to get that knowledge. If you want to talk about that, mm -hmm. I'd love to hear what your I, thoughts are. I, I'll bring it back to emotion. Cause like people always say, oh, you talk so much about logic and reason, Travis, but, but what do you have against emotion? Nothing. I love emotion. However, I think we don't have a good understanding of it. Like um, for instance, uh, jealousy. Mm -hmm. When someone uh, you talked about coming in fifth place, jealousy is quite health. Envy is that's different. different. That's horrible. Jealousy is a good thing. Like, oh man, that, the first place I'm jealous. I would like that as well. Hey, you have a nice car, nice home. I'm jealous. I would like that as well. Um, that's what my jealousy drives people. Envy. Well, that's destructive. Like right. I don't want anyone to have it because I can't have it. And they very, I hope he um, gets into an accident with that really nice car. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's Different. evil. Yeah. I hope and, he loses his voice when he's singing. <laughs> you know, <laughs> <what> he's saying. <laughs> and um, so like jealousy, anger, fear, these things, like we live in this, like this, like I've talked before, this postmodernist world where we just want to ignore the negative. And the, mm -hmm. But fear is, fear is not a negative thing. If you're like antelope and you see a lion, right. like fear, when a prey sees a predator, Fear is what keeps you alive. Yeah. Fear is how you know to act and react. Anger is you should have. I mean, if uh, if Gino just struck me mm -hmm. unprovoked and I didn't get angry, something's wrong with me, mm -hmm. right? Anger, fear, the, they don't need to be ignored. They need to be understood. Yes. And like uh, same with jealousy. And but we're t we're doing everything we can to sedate our kids and protect them from all this stuff. And it, it's impossible because it's just a it's just an absolute denial of reality. Mm -hmm. And we need to understand it, not avoid it. Yeah, but I like that. There's so many more questions. I would really love to dive into it. If just you want to take us home uh, as far as, you know, next step for parents, like I said, Restoring Reason. It, it's a great book. I mean, I read it in a couple of days. My wife says she read it in a day. And that's why we're so excited to get you back on because it really is for the parents. Parents don't know where to turn. I mean, all of a sudden COVID opened everyone's well, parents, eyes. So but what's... also just people in general. And I, and I think that's important is just to have, have relationships just in general, yes, not, yes. not even parents. And, and I, you know, 
I'm going to bring back the debate versus discussion. To me, that's the mm -hmm. most important thing that I've heard in a podcast in years, because it seems that sometimes I want to win and I want to be able to say, hey, my thought is better than yours, but let's have an open debate. But the problem nowadays is everyone gets shut down because mm -hmm. you're either racist, you're homophobic or something, and yeah. then you can't even make that, you can't even have. So what, I, what that says to me is their arguments are not anywhere near where the other person's arguments are. Because if you can't debate the person and you start calling name calling, then right. you should look within and say, well, why am I calling this person a name? Let me at least hear his arguments. Let me counter argue and see whose ideas are better because that's what we want in life. Well, the better the ideas, you had mentioned the quality of your mind leads to the quality of the decisions leads to the quality of your life. So if you want to yeah. have a great life, be open-minded. If someone has a better idea, a better solution, go towards that and your yeah. life is going to be so much better. Yeah. And I, and I, I know that you wanted to wrap this up, but I, I want to get your thoughts on truth because that's to me, oh, yes. when you were talking about objective truth, you know, it doesn't matter if you, whether you know it, like it, or believe it, the truth yeah. is there. And I think that's something that we also have to think about when we're in a situation. If you want to yeah. touch on that, I would love to hear your thoughts. Well, so you guys brought up so many good things. I'd love to touch on all of it, <laughs> but um, the truth is very simple. People like talk about it all the time, but they, they've never really defined it. Mm -hmm. Truth is truth is simple. It's um, a principled statement that conforms to reason and usually supported by evidence. Mm -hmm. A principled statement that conforms to reason. That's the truth. And a lot of people, they, they can try and deny it all they want, but um, deny for me the truth of gravity. Jump off the building and tell me how quick uh, objective reality smacks you in the face. Right, the truth is there. It is objective. Uh, one of the things we can do, going back to what Gino was saying too, is to avoid this. Like, I want to win. I want to win. Because we all get that feeling to a degree, and that's because we're attaching ourselves to our perspectives. So I would say instead of like, here's my perspective, I would say here's a perspective. Instead of using possessive pronouns before belief, idea, perspective, it's better to use like an indefinite article, a or an or the like that or that perspective, this perspective. And that's how we get out of the debate mode into the discussion, how we both really win and we come closer. There's a lot to learn. There's, I mean, I'll never know and understand everything. No one will, but I love to get as close as I can to the truth because I know the closer my perception is, the closer my perception aligns with objective reality, the better decisions I'm making in business and in investments in my relationship with my children, whatever. That is the way to go forward. Not this, um, well, I'm uncomfortable, so I'm just going to deny it. Oh, well, everything's subjective. You know, uh, that, oh, we could talk about this. I could go on for a lot, but I know we got to wrap this up. No, no, not again. Let's let's keep this going. This is important because my truth, I feel like a cat today. How do you how do you go and, and, and debate that? I, I'm fluid. I, I just don't feel, you know, yeah. how, well, how am I as a rational person going to debate that? I don't even know how you feel. I know how I feel. I know what my, my sex is. And how do you debate somebody like that? Cause that, this is truly important because we're getting yeah. confused. Our children are getting confused and the adults are going along with it saying, Oh, well, I have to really abide by what they're saying. My daughter wants me to use this or say, how do we debate that? How do we like, when I, and yeah. they get insulted, they get offended and it goes up. And like you said, you can't have a discussion with them because yeah. it's like, I, that's the, someone's going to lose that's, that is probably the easiest and most surefire way to shut down discussion is like um it, the first one to pull like emotional outrage like you know that that person can no longer rationally defend their their position look i'm offended and and over whatever it could be anything it could be the words you used what's your, your the ide ideology you're representing and you can't even uh, have a simple discussion that conforms to reason. Instead, it's, well, I want out, but I, I want out of the discussion and the appearance that I'm noble and uh, virtuous, right? I, rather than be virtuous, I'm going to signal how virtuous I am. And so by to do that, it's very simple. We've been given the tools and the tactics. Call the other person something derogatory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're a flat earther or a what, you know, and they add all these other things too. like, um, it's just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. If you're if you're for liberty, oh, you're chauvinistic or what, um, bigots or racist, transphobe, what you simply want to talk about, have a discussion about freedom. How do you handle it personally? I want to know that. You probably don't even get lost. <laughs> Tell us how to handle it. I don't got time to waste on this nonsense. But at the same yeah. time, that's what we have to do because we are we we're truth seekers. Because we we're want freedom we fighters. Want to that's what we want to do. We yes. want a discussion with people. I love having discussion with people 
that don't agree with what I'm talking about, because I like to hear their other side. And I'm as much as I try, I do try to stay calm and listen to the other side, ask questions. But there is moments where it's like you were saying, there's no, you can't have that discussion. Have you ever been successful in that situation? Yeah. Lot, lots of times, especially okay. in my, own, in my own profession. And I'll tell you where we were talking about that a little bit before with your, your father. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll, I'll say this, there are where I have the most success is people that I would say are to one extreme of objective reality rather than the other. And I, I break it into the spiritualists and the materialists. The materialists would be like, um, they really love appeal to authority and um, you know evidence-based and knowledge is power like the, well only knowledge from the authorities it's very e- i have way more success with these people than i do with the like more spiritual um, appeal to emotion uh, everything is kind of wishy-washy i my perception creates reality rather than contributes to you know i there's a lot of good stuff in there but the misunderstanding i'm talking about the extreme right And the reason I have more success with this side is because it's easier to pick someone up off the ground than it is to pull someone's head out of the clouds. Mm -hmm. And with those people, however, though, those people whose heads are in the clouds, they are less confrontational. You know, they deal with conflict uh, in flight mode where these like appeal to authority group, they, um, they deal with stress with fight mode. So they're ready to enter into a debate and then it's just up to me to switch it into a discussion. And what I've done for myself is I've just given up all expectations that I will turn them in that moment. And my experience has shown that I've, I'll get like private messages two to three, even some five years later saying, uh, I remember this discussion we had and I was out of line. And I really thought like, I understand what you're saying now. And those you know, you, you want to unattach yourself, but those victories like kind of feel good Mm -hmm. and knowing that I'm doing the right thing, but it's taught me to not have any expectations in the moment. Like the seed, you you can plant those seeds, but don't, don't expect to harvest the, you know, harvest the tomatoes the day you plant the seed, just be patient, detach yourself from the outcome. So that is is the best advice because we do want we want that right away. We want them to see what we're talking about. And and I agree. And I, and now that you're talking about, I'm I'm thinking of a lot of conversations we had over the years where many, many years later, all of a sudden they are agreeing with what we're doing. I'm like, hold on a second. And I don't say anything, but I, I hear what you're saying. And I, and I think that's great. It's definitely practice patience. The way I could recap this whole podcast is there are the five that we're going up against, but shows like this books like this, Mm -hmm. There are so many out there, Joe Rogan. I mean, there's so many things that are going against the media. It it gives me hope and and to say that there's a lot of different mediums out there. And you you see what happened on CNN. They're going down the tubes because people are are, are understanding what's going on. They're understanding the lies and they're understanding it. So if people can see through that and nobody has any faith in those institutions anyway, the average person has very little faith in them. At least they can go back and there's other channels, other mediums that they can watch. And it's really important to continue to educate ourselves and for us, it's been, it's been, I wouldn't say difficult, but it's challenging to do something against the grain. And you just have to apply logic, apply reason and work together, work as a team to get it through. But also Dr. Travis, you had mentioned to have a purpose in the beginning, when you were making a goal, you have to have a reason behind it. And I think that's why we started homeschooling. I really wasn't sure what the reason was at first because the kids were all little, but I knew there was something. And, And I look back now, you know, we have, we have one still in college, one's out of college, four of them are still home. And I, and I, my purpose was there all along. I just couldn't define it as well as I could now. And I, and I think that's super important. So when we're going against other people, we're going against what normal, normal people are doing, I should say, there has to be a reason behind it. And we have to be, we have to be sure of it. Yeah. It's much easier to stand your ground when you know what your ground is. If you don't know what your purpose is and you don't have a purpose statement and you know it word for word and you can recite it on command, then you really don't have a purpose. Mm-hmm. Where can the listeners get a hold of you? Uh, the best is always to reach me at restoringreason.com. If you go to restoringreason.com, you can actually download the first chapter of the book as well. So no strings attached, see what it's all about. If maybe you like it. And just like uh, Julia said, uh, it's a very easy read. Mm-hmm. It's meant to be that way. It's meant to be that way. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Some of these books are so, I mean, I did look at the trivium, the, the sister Mary, what was her name? Sister Mary, yeah. yeah her, and I was just like, woof, <laughs> like, okay, <laughs> you know, you let me know what that says. <laughs> well, I think I, what my goal is for everyone listening to the show is to really take a step back, use your emotions mm -hmm. intelligently. I mean, let them feel you, let them guide you, let them really make you feel passionate mm -hmm. about it, but don't let them guide all the decisions and take a step back and use logic and use reason. And this is long-termism. You're going to continue yeah. to make these decisions and these small decisions you're making are going to affect you in the long term. So try to make yeah. wise, intelligent, logical, rational decisions throughout every part of your life mm -hmm. with your family with your faith with your finances with your health with your fitness and try to encapsulate it throughout and take a step back and it's okay if you're going against what everyone else is doing at some point like dr travis just said you need to have a purpose you need to have a reason why so i want to thank you once again for being on the show and you know once again restoring reason go out there pick it up and let's start restoring reason everyone thanks everyone thanks thank you guys